thank you very much for coming. Um, so Jeff is currently professor in communication culture and technology at Georgetown University, and he's also a senior fellow in residence at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. A little bit about his past. He received his MA from University of Chicago, and then he completed his PhD in comparative literature um, at uh, University of California in Berkeley. <laughs> he then taught at the University of Washington in Seattle for a while at, uh, in the departments of German comparative literature and in the program in Jewish studies. Then he spent several years at Georgetown University, this is where I know him from, uh, where he was faculty member at the Center for German and European Studies as well as in the German department and he also directed the Jewish Studies Initiative at the Georgia University. His research focuses on questions of national and minority identities, particular German-Jewish life since unification, and contemporary responses to the Holocaust in a transatlantic context. In 2004, he edited while well, at the A, um, AICGS, it's uh, the American Center for Contemporary German Studies. He edited a report called The Jewish Voice in Transatlantic Relations, and in 2005 he published an essay also for AICGS called American Jews in an Evangelical America. Uh, he is also co-author of Sojourners, The Return of German Jews and the Question of Identity, as well as a co-editor of a very interesting uh, volume of essays, Cultural Contexture, Explorations in Anthropology and Literary Studies. And please um, help me welcome my mentor and friend, um, Jeff Beck. Thank you, Joanna. And um, I want to thank all of the uh, co-sponsoring organizations uh, who invited me, and especially Joanna, one of my best students, <laughs> who invited me here. Um, what I'm going to be doing in the next 30 minutes is not to give a formal academic talk, but rather to introduce you to some of the uh, material in my new book, uh, Being Jewish in the New Germany, as well as to share with you some of the claims that I'm making about identity in the New Germany since unification. Um, and then we'll have some questions and answers. Uh, the story of this book is both a story about identity in question, both in terms of, I think, myself, as well as uh, Jewish life in Germany. Uh, when I decided upon the title for this book, Being Jewish in the New Germany, I didn't realize, as is often the case when any authors write texts, that the interpretation of the text goes far beyond what you may have intended. Um, I realized that the title, Being Jewish in the New Germany, is not just about Jewish life in Germany since 1989-90 when the Berlin Wall fell and Germany was reunited. It was also about my status as an ethnographer who was living and studying in Germany and writing a narrative about this particular group of people. And I make that very explicit in the book so that um, it's very clear that the story that I'm telling about Jewish life in Germany is an American story that would be different if someone were to write this book from a German perspective or a German-Jewish perspective. As an American Jew who has worked on Germany uh, for all of, all of my life, uh, although I didn't work on the topic of Jewish life, it became very clear to me as I started going to Germany, and even before that when I started studying German, that the question always emerged, why are you doing this? Why is a Jewish person studying the country that was uh, in charge of a European genocide to try to destroy Jewish life? That question emerged over and over again, um, both from Germans who would often say to me, why, are you, why would you want to be here? And also from American Jews in particular who would ask the questions that I just mentioned. So it wasn't until 1988 that I decided with a colleague in anthropology to do a project specifically on the Jews, which was the book Sojourners that Joanna mentioned in a documentary film where we looked at Jews who came back to live in Germany in East and West Berlin after the Second World War. Uh, as is obvious from the dates, in 1989, history intervened and the Berlin Wall fell and Germany became reunited and we had to rethink the entire issue of identity uh, as it had to do with um, Jews who had come back to live there. 
Um, this project that I'm presenting to you today in this new book is a continuation of the last one. And as I say, it became clear then even later in the middle of the 90s that something was happening in Germany. Uh, and this is the story that I tell. Um, the story that I'm going to talk about, though, is not just about life in Germany for Jews who have come there uh, who are primarily immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Uh, I also try to put this question in an international and transatlantic context, which means that um, I will try to talk to you at least a little bit about the various parts of this book and how I try to situate this issue in a number of different ways. But let me start out with some important facts for an American audience, um, because one of the reasons that I wrote this book was that I felt that Americans in general, and American Jews in particular, were actually quite ignorant about what was going on in Germany in the last 15 years. I felt that Americans and American Jews in particular, uh, and I knew this from my own family, still thought of Germany uh, as the land of the Nazis. And while it's very important, of course, to recognize the Holocaust and what happened during those 12 terrible years, I felt that it was important to try to paint a more nuanced and differentiated picture of what had been happening since reunification. And as I say, this, in a sense, was the mission uh, of my book of education. Um, but let me start with some important facts. First of all, it's important to understand this immigration. Since 1989, probably over 120,000 uh, immigrants, uh, Jews, in quotation marks, which I'll talk about in a minute, emigrated from the former Soviet <coughs> Union, primarily from Russia, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, and the Baltic Republics. Now, this immigration has now changed the entire profile of Jewish life in Germany. The Jewish community in Germany today is the third largest in Europe after uh, the UK and France, and it is the fastest growing Jewish community in the world. There are approximately 105,000 Jews who live in Germany today, 12,000 in Berlin in the capital, which is the, the city that I really focus on in this book. But there are also over 90 congregations all over Germany, and there is Jewish life around the entire country. Now, one of the great ironies and one of the interesting parts of this story is the fact that at the same time that this immigration from the former Soviet Union, uh, which granted uh, Jews from there a special status of quota refugees, which allowed them to come to Germany more easily, to get social welfare benefits, language classes, and so on. While this immigration literally saved the very aging Jewish community of Germany, which was about 20,000 in 1989, which had been 500,000 in 1933, that although this immigration saved the Jewish community, it's also created an entire new set of problems. And it's those problems that I find particularly interesting because they raise a number of important issues about questions of identity, in particular Jewish identity and German identity. It's important to understand that in Germany, unlike in the United States, there is what is called an Einheitsgemeinde, a unified community. It means that the Central Council of Jews in Germany uh, under the directorship of, at the, current, at the moment, Paul Spiegel, previously Ignaz Bubis, is the central organ for representing Jewish life in Germany. It's who the government of Germany speaks to. It's the organization that receives money from the government, and so on. This idea for a Einheitsgemeinde, a unified community, was necessary at the end of the war. Because at the end of the war, after the uh, Nazi genocide, there were many, many Jews who had moved from Eastern Europe who were called displaced persons, DPs. There was a ban on living Jewish life in Germany, and it was felt that all Jews should leave German soil. But in fact, not all did or could, and there were maybe around 20 to 30,000 Jews who wound up living in Germany and making their life there, primarily Polish Jews and other Eastern European Jews. And this is the community that made up the, the, the bulk of the Jewish community afterwards. But as I said, it aged, didn't produce many children, and many of the children who were produced left and went other places. So the Jewish community, because it's an Einheitsgemeinde, also means that, the, that, that there is a central authority in the community. 
The community is also a religious community, a Glaubensgemeinschaft. Judaism, being Jewish, is defined by Jewish law, which is called halacha. What it means is that to be a member of the community with a capital C, you must have a Jewish mother or be converted by an Orthodox rabbi. This causes a significant problem. In fact, I gave a talk last night, and a woman there who was a German Jewish refugee said, those, Jews, those people aren't even Jews. Well, this is the interesting question. Many, if not most, of the Jews who came from the former Soviet Union came because they had the word Jew in their passport on the fifth line, which designated a nationality. Because of that, the German government, and one can imagine that the German government was not want to tell Jews who wanted to come and live in Germany, no, you can't come here. So the, Jewish, the German government was very uh, open, as long as they saw the passport, of letting people come in who said they were Jewish. But the Jewish community within Germany was not as flexible, and has not been as flexible. And the Jewish community in Germany demands certain requirements. And what this has created is a situation where you have many, many people who consider themselves to be Jews either because they have a Jewish father and a Gentile mother, or a Jewish grandparent, uh, or simply saying we are Jewish, that are not permitted to become members of the community. So when you hear numbers about how many people there are in the Jewish community of 105,000, that only means the numbers who are official members who are officially Jewish. There are thousands and thousands of other people who consider themselves to be Jewish who do not belong to the community. Now. What this means is, is, as perhaps is obvious, is that there are people who feel in some ways disenfranchised. To deal with that disenfranchisement, there are a number of other organizations that are growing in Germany. And it's very important, and this is part of the international component, is to look at the ways that some American Jewish organizations and religious uh, organizations have come to Germany and are trying to make a place for Jews. You have Chabad Lubavitch, which now has a large center in Berlin. I interview the rabbi in the book, and he's very hopeful and very enthusiastic about Jewish life in Germany. Uh, the Chabad Lubavitch is, in fact, building a new center. Most interesting religiously, I think, is the influence and the uh, movement now of the World Union of Progressive Jewry, Reform Judaism, that has now come to Germany. And it's another one of these interesting ironies that Reform Judaism, which began in Germany and was the place where the first Jewish female rabbi, Regina Jonas, uh, became a rabbi, is now the place that Reformed Jewry is coming back to. And uh, this is creating, there are many, many new small congregations of Reformed Jews, uh, and this has caused a great deal of tension in the Jewish community because the Central Council of Jews in Germany has not been happy about this. Now, many people say where you have 10 Jews, you'll have 10 different opinions, and this is the case in Germany, uh, and you see the struggle that goes on. Some of this struggle has to do with resources, because the, the Jew Jewish community as Catholic and Protestant institutions also receives money from the government. So some of this has to do with questions of resources, but some of it has to do with questions of how do you define what is a Jew. Now, we're familiar with that in Israel. In, in America, we have that as well, although the categories are much more flexible. But in Germany, because of the, the definition of the Jewish co uh, Central Council, it has made the situation very complex. In addition to these organizations, you also have some NGOs that are very, very important. The American Jewish Committee, for example, which has chapters all over the United States, has now opened an office in Berlin. It's now 10 years that this office has been there. That office functions as a, uh, a place where many uh, German politicians come, where many American Jews come, and where dialogue takes place. Now, the German uh, Jewish community itself at first was not particularly happy that an American Jewish organization was taking on the role that they felt they should have. So here you have another tension that exists in this relationship between American Jews and the indigenous German Jewish community. You also have the Ronald Lauder Foundation, which has opened up camps, summer camps for um, children throughout Europe. And they've created a Lehrhaus, an adult school in Germany. And as the rabbi said, this is to teach Russian Jew, Jewish men how to be Jews. 
because you have to understand that mo many of these Jews have no Jewish upbringing. They don't know anything about what it means to be a Jew. They don't know how to read Hebrew. They don't know the traditions. They don't know the rituals. And many of them want that, and these other organizations are providing some opportunity. You have feminist groups. You have gay and lesbian groups. You have the Jewish cultural group that was started in the former East Germany that is a place where un or non-religious Jews can go to um, be educated at about cultural, uh, have cultural events and to meet other Jews who are not religious. So the point that I'm trying to get across, that today in Germany, in a place like Berlin, you have a wide array of different kinds of organizations. You also have, as I said, the largest population of about 12,000 in the community. But you also have a great deal of struggle and tension and turmoil. I like to look at this situation of Germany and the various uh, kinds of Jews as a part of what's going on in Germany in general to, to, to perhaps categorize under the broad rubric of multiculturalism. Germany uh, was not traditionally an immigration country, but now it, the rule laws have changed, the citizenship laws have changed, and you see that Germany as well is becoming a much more diverse place. One of the questions that I raise in my book is what role will the Jews in Germany play in the future? Now, I also want to talk about Israel briefly. I have a chapter about Israel. Israel and the United States are thought of as the two world pillars, the two pillars of, Euro of world Jewry. Many of European Jews, especially those who are now uh, organized in the European Council of Jewish Communities, feel that they would like to make European Jewry a third pillar along with Israel and the United States. They have meetings, they have or, uh, organizations, there are a great deal, a number of youth groups that meet around Europe, there are summer universities, and there's even a website, in case any of you students are interested, jeuropee.com, Europa, where you can meet young European Jews. So the internet has also infiltrated Jewish life in Europe. But the relationship to Israel is one also that American Jews are unfortunately unfamiliar with. Israel is, Germany is considered by both, um, by the Israelis and by Germany as, as having a special relationship. Germany is Israel's best friend in Europe as America is in North America. Yet, while sometimes political elites are um, required to be uh, uh, open towards the German relationship. There have been cases where, for example, in the mid-90s, Israeli President Ezra Weizmann, who was the first uh, president of Israel to speak at the Bundestag, came to Germany and said, I don't know why Jews are living here. They shouldn't live here, he said to Ignaz Bubis, who was the head of the Jewish community. And uh, he said, I think if I lived in Germany, I'd be afraid that every time I turn around, somebody's calling me a dirty Jew. That so those statements sparked a great deal of controversy in the Jewish community and reminded many of the Jews who lived in Germany that they were to think about what it meant, again, to be living in the land, what was called the land of the murderers. Only six or seven years later, in, 19, in 2003, during the OSCE meeting on anti-Semitism that took place in Berlin, where I was, um, Moshe Katzav, the president of, the, of the Israel, came to Germany and did not make such statements. What did he do first? He inaugurated a new synagogue in the city of Wuppertal. I say this partly, there's a much more complicated story involved, but um, I say this because it's important in understanding the, uh, what the Jewish community in Germany is about, is to understand their relationship to, Germ uh, to Israelis, to Americans, and to the rest of Europe. It's not, it's not possible, I think, to see their um, situation in isolation. Now, in the book, I also do talk about the Holocaust. And it's very clear that the Holocaust still remains a shadow over the life of Jews who live in Germany. I have a whole chapter on um, American and German responses since the late 1960s to look at the ways that the Germans have come to terms with the Holocaust. The most prominent example today is the opening of the Monument to the Murdered Jews of Europe, which stands at the Brandenburg Gate in the center of Berlin. Now, along with this monument is the Jewish Museum. 
excuse me, is the Jewish Museum. The Jewish Museum is very important because not only does it educate non-Jewish Germans to the 2,000 year history of German Jewish life, it also makes a point, which is a point that I also make in my book, is to talk about Jewish identity in Germany is simultaneously to talk about German identity in Germany. Because if we see the relationship between Germans and Jews historically, and we see the very close relationship that the Germans and Jews have had, that when there are Jews in Germany, and when there's interaction between Germans and Jews, Germans must also reflect on who they are and what their position is towards this new Jewish community. This is the reason that my book uh, is generally optimistic, even if I admit uh, the ambivalence of many of the Jews who live in Germany. One of the things I think that's important also to understand about the new Jewish community in regards to the past, and many Americans don't know this either, is that for many Jews who came from the former Soviet Union, the Holocaust is not the issue around which they build their identity. Some of that has to do with the fact that many of the Jews who lived in the former Soviet Union of a particular age were de dealing with Stalin. Their families, their uh, relatives were being sent away or murdered. Some of it has to do with ignorance. But what will be important to look for in the coming generations in Germany is how will the Jewish, the Russian Jews, let's call them, who have come, how will they take on the uh, past, I mean the past of the Holocaust. It is not the past of the rich German Jewish community of 500,000 that existed before the Second World War. It's very important to understand, I think, that the German Jewish community, the rich secular community, who often said in the 1930s that Hitler made us into Jews because they were so assimilated and so uh, much of felt that they were so German. That German Jewish tradition in terms of people is over. But my claim in the book is that there will be a new German Jewish identity that I hope will be created. This will be a German Jewish identity that is obviously more Eastern European, more Russian, more European, perhaps more cosmopolitan, but it will be a hybrid identity. It will be an identity that is constructed through these various positions that I've tried to describe in my book. And while it might finally be called German Jewish again, it will be a different meaning of the term, which I think shows to us how dynamic a process identity is and how we have to constantly change our categories to accommodate new identities that emerge. Let me finally just come to this point, and this is also very important for me. When I talk about Jewish life in Germany, I don't only talk about the numbers of people, about demography. Perhaps because I've been schooled so much in postmodernism, I think of the issue of representation as equally important. What I'm saying is that the representations of Jews, the discourse that is created around Jewish life, even <clears throat> even by non-Jews, for me, is a part of creating a Jewish identity in Germany. And there are some examples of this. The Jewish Museum, of course, is the most prominent with its 2,000-year history exhibition of German Jewish life. Michael Blumenthal, uh, the American who um, was, in, I think, in the Carter administration, who is the director, has said this should not be a Holocaust museum. This should be a museum showing the rich relationship of German-Jewish life. There is also, and most Americans are not aware of this, a rich German-Jewish literature. These are the texts that I taught Joanna when she was my student. This is, there's a rich literature of second-generation German Jews who are writing about questions of identity, about who they are, about what it means to be living in Germany, how they come to terms with the past. Unfortunately, much of this literature is not yet translated into English. Names like Barbara Honigmann, Raphael Zelichmann, Maxim Biller, and so on. There are also many Jewish-German journalists and publicists 
who speak not only about Jewish issues, but are in the general public sector. People like Henrik Broder, Raphael Zelichman again, Misha Brumlich, and others. These people are writing for major German magazines and newspapers, are recognized as being Jews, and very important in the public sphere. Aside from this, there is an enormous growth of um, interest in Jewish topics. There are Jewish film festivals. There are exhibitions about Jewish life. There are um, uh, uh, programs on television and so on. Now, there are many people, and it's important to say this, who are very critical of this and look at this as simply trendiness, a fascination with the exotic. And there was a period of time in the mid-90s where the area in the former East Berlin around the Oranienburger Straße synagogue, the one that has the gold cupola that some of you might know, where there were so-called Jewish restaurants. Well, those restaurants were often Israeli. They weren't German Jewish. You have the proliferation of klezmer music in Germany that many people like myself feel a little uncomfortable with because it is an Eastern European Jewish phenomenon and not a German phenomenon. And it often is criticized for presenting itself in a, uh, a way that gives the impression that this is something about Jewish life in Germany. There's also the concern, and this is something that one might talk about, and uh, Ruth Gruber wrote the, talks about this in her book, Virtually Jewish, is that mo most of the activity around Jews in Germany is done by non-Jews. And I think the question one has to ask oneself is, do you have to be Jewish? Just like the old rye bread ad, most of you don't know anymore. Um, I just was at a conference with Jewish studies scholars from Germany and the United States, and one of the questions was, um, and this gets raised in American Jewish studies programs as well. Do you have to be Jewish? Well, of course not. You don't have to be Jewish to do Jewish studies. It's an academic discipline. But what about the people in Germany or in Poland, for example, who are creating Jewish cultural festivals, who are recreating Jewish areas of cities? How important is it that these people are Jews? And of course, if one asks that question, one has to ask, well, what definition of Jewishness or, Jew, or Judaism are we using? So I'll conclude just by saying that one of the, some of the claims that I make in the book are that there will be a new German Jewish identity. It will be a different hybrid identity. That there are many, many institutions that have been created for Jewish life, kindergartens, schools. There are bar and bat mitzvahs. There are weddings. But the question will be is, can the Jewish community find a way to accommodate difference, even within the Jewish community itself? And will there be institutions in the future that will make a place for Jews of all kinds? I think if this can happen, there's an there's a, a more, even more optimistic future. German uh, demography is showing that birth rate is going down among Germans as well as Jews in Germany. There need to be babies born. There need to be people who stay in Germany and build a life. And while many of the people who live there are ambivalent, I think that it's important, and I hope that they will decide to stay, because it's not only important for these immigrants, it's important for the Germans to have Jews living among them. Thank you. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to. Yes, sir. I, re I point it to you. Who are the non-European immigrants? Well, I don't want to uh, label them as non-European, but they're mostly from like uh, Muslim countries, like right. Muslim countries. Right. In regards to the growing number of immigrants in uh, Germany, what challenges are you posing? Good. That's a good question. And it reminds me there was just one point that I had forgotten to mention. One of the chapters in the book that lately has received a lot of attention is a chapter I have called Jews and Turks 
which is to look at Jews and Turks as minority groups, very much as we do in America, looking at potential solidarities that exist or don't exist between people of color, Jews, other groups. This is a very American perspective. I, try, I make the point that while there are ways that one can see similarities, that one shouldn't compare Jews and Turks because they have it's an entirely different context. But what it does bring up, and I say this in the end of that chapter, is that the, the issue, frankly, for the future of Germany and Europe is not so much about Jewish identity. I think, as we all know, it's about how will Muslims be integrated or not integrated into European society. And I'm not surprised when you gave the, said who, who, was, who this was, because the anti-Semitic incidents that have taken place in Germany in the last four or five years, especially since the Second Intifada, have been committed by um, usually young Muslim men. Um, frankly, though, and many people often ask me, is there anti-Semitism in Germany? Of course there's anti-Semitism in Germany. There's anti-Semitism, I think, in every country. But I don't have any, I'm not fearful about what that means. I am fearful in France about the, the rise of anti-Semitism. Um, and it's important to know, and this is often forgotten, that the Muslims who live in Germany are Turks. There are 2.7 million Turks who were originally guest workers. While the German, Germans have not been particularly good in many ways as integrating the Turks in Germany, the situation there is much better for them than it is, say, in France for the North African immigrants. And again, this has to do with social class, it has to do with citizenship laws, it has to do with a number of different issues. But um, I would say that any, most of the anti-Semitism, or if there's anti-Semitism in Germany, it's usually from those groups. And there are scattered neo-Nazi groups that from time to time. But I think that it's important to note that uh, Germany has done, and I think obviously why it should be doing it, has come really done a great deal to try to deal with the past in terms of education and so on in ways that countries like France, certainly Austria, uh, and other countries have not. So yes, there is anti-Semitism, there is racism, there are the same kinds of things that exist everywhere, but I think I have no fears that there will be uh, danger for the Jews of Germany. I sometimes have fears that there are danger for the Jews of France. Yes. Speaking with Arsene, how much, how much communication is there between the, the Jewish community in Germany with the Jews in other countries? Yeah. Right. Well, as I said, there's the World Jewish Congress, and then there's also this European Council of Jewish Communities, um, which has representatives from the different communities who meet regularly. Um, it turns out, for example, right now, one of the, exec one of the high level administrators in the um, Jewish community in Berlin is a British Jew who was very involved in British Jewish matters and was also very involved in the European Jewish Council. So there is more and more attempts, sometimes because of anti-Semitism, and sometimes simply of realizing that we Jews in Europe have to try to create more networks. Um, one of the interesting issues is that with the European Union expansion, many Jews who are in the Eastern European countries, like in Poland, for example, uh, where there's been a small rebirth of a community, um, have been grateful for their inclusion in the European Union because they feel that they will have more protection under rights for minorities in the European Union Constitution. Um, the difference is that many of these countries have not dealt with their own pasts, and so it still remains to be seen how well those the Jews who live in these other countries that are coming into the European Union, if being in the European Union might facilitate more exchange. What was striking about the OSCE meeting, um, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe meeting on anti-Semitism, there was a whole series of meetings from then, then there was, a, there was one meeting that was specifically on education and the internet, the way the internet is being used to propagate anti-Semitism and racism, and there continue to be conferences like this that are sponsored by European organizations that bring Jews together from all over Europe. Um, so some of it is individual and some of it is institutional. Yes.
involved in this. And you said that in this changing identity with more Eastern European Jews coming in, the Holocaust is becoming less of an important, or maybe a- Yeah, no, no, it's not that it's, it, it, how should I put it? It's still very important, but for, in, for many individual people who come from the former Soviet Union, they don't have that relationship to the Holocaust that we in North America or the West do. Right. Well, I think I think that for anybody, any German, that uh, it's important that the end. Of course, Germans who are not Jewish know, and I think it's important for any Jewish person who lives anywhere or lives in Germany to be aware of this. The reason I make a point about this is that for a long time in Germany, and now this is going to sound a little crass, if you'll excuse me, um, and ger some German Jewish authors have said this themselves and journalists that the German government and the Germans were better at commemorating dead Jews than they were at living with real Jews. And I think that it's important that one recognizes that there is a living Jewish community that needs to be supported and encouraged, and I think the German government is doing that. I think there needs to be a balance between commemorating the Holocaust and the past and recognizing that there is a Jewish life that is there that needs to be supported and encouraged, and that, um, and I think this should be the case in, in um, all over Europe. As I say at the end of my talk, Jewish life in Germany, as we know, had been a very important part. When I used to go to Germany in the early 80s, maybe this was my imagination, but one would always feel that there was something missing or there was a, there was a group of people who weren't there. And you, we knew who they were. There were no Jews there. Now there are Jews who come from a different tradition. And um, there are also many Israelis, many Americans who are living in the larger cities. Um, so I guess what I would say is there needs to be a balance. There needs to be commemoration. There needs to be also recognition of what is going on today in Germany in this Jewish community. So when people say to me often, there should be no Jews in Germany, I can only disagree with them because for the reasons, the reasons that I gave. And I think, and the first part of my book is called From Why to How, is that it I think 15 or 20 years ago, one would say more, well, why are Jews living in Germany? And what I wanted to explore was, how are Jews living in Germany? What is the different ways that they're trying? And I think when you see these American organizations or Israeli involvement, um, and the other thing about Israel is, um, in 2002 or 2003, there were more Jews who emigrated to Germany than Israel. Israelis were not happy about that, and they sent people from the Jewish agency to Germany to find out more about this. And I think for the German government, as I said before, they're not want to tell Jews not to come. Um, for the Jewish community in Germany, who a few years ago made an official trip and has contacts, obviously, with the Israelis, said, we understand your problem with that, but we also need to have Jews in our community as well, and we have to try to find a way of balancing this. So um, what's clearer, though, is that in the last 15 and 20 years that the German-Jewish identity has become stronger and more embedded in Germany and not only looking to Israel or to the United States. Yes. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the question of how Israeli policies in recent years have affected both Jews in Germany and generalized anti-Semitism. Okay, so yeah, not, right, not right. And I'm thinking, you know, and you just mentioned that, may, or maybe I heard in there that maybe <clears throat> Well, okay. Uh -huh. I'm thinking about this in the context of the French debates about how anti Zionism is anti Israeli And there's a recent American debate about the Mirsham and all right. the debates about the Very much the same. Body. Right. So is there a debate in Germany about um, the, the role of Jews in the Austrian government? Is there a reaction among Germans in general, you know, sort of see Jews as a unified group? Okay, good, very complicated, but it's important. Let me start out with this way. I think that the issue in Germany has, has, has um, been characterized very much in the way that it has been in other places during the Second Intifada and the reaction in Israel, which is how are German politicians, should German politicians be able to speak publicly and criticize Israel? 
And the second point is, when, as you mentioned, when does, anti, when does criticism of Israeli politics become either anti-Zionism or anti-Semitism? And this has been the center of much of that debate. In the German government, um, one thing is very clear. No matter who is in power in Germany, whether it's Schroeder, who is a social democrat, or whether it's Angela Merkel, who is a Christian democrat, Israel remains a friend to Germany. Israel will be supported. What that doesn't mean, of course, that becomes increasingly the case, is that the German elite, political elites also feel that they have to be able to say if they feel that certain policies that Israel is carrying out are, to them, problematic. However, in Germany, it is still difficult. There's still a taboo, that's the term the Germans use, a taboo for German politicians to speak too critically of Israel. And there's a debate around that is how much can we say, Should we, are we now not at a place where we can speak more openly? This leads to an important issue which is categorized under the term normalization. Do, should there be a normalization in Germany? In the, should we look towards a normalization between Germans and Jews so that Jew, being Jewish or Israel is just like any other country? And that's a question that remains to be seen and, and many people have different. Some people feel there should always be this bit of discomfort for a German politician to say something too critical about the Jews or Israel. Others say, if we want to operate as a democratic society in Europe, we have to be able to speak out. So the debate revolves around what can one say and where can one say it. But, um, and this was a, part, a big part of the discussion at the OECE conference. Yehuda Bauer, who was there, made a very simple statement that I thought was very helpful. He said, you know, um, if someone says, Ariel Sharon, I don't like Ariel Sharon's politics. That's acceptable. That's a political statement. But if someone says, I don't like Ariel Sharon's politics and it's typically Jewish, that's anti-Semitic. And that I don't think that those kinds of nuances are often made explicit enough in the debate. There's no question that the Second Intifada um, had changed the, the, the environment in Germany uh, around all kinds of relations. But I think it's important to point out, too, that in the Jewish community, you have a wide spectrum of political positions. You have leftist Jews in Germany who protest the Iraq War. You have Jews who are more conservative, who supported the Iraq War. Um, and in a sense, this, this new debate, this Merzheimer debate that's come up now, it's being discussed, is very much the same debate that was, was going on in Germany over the last five years. I hope that gets at some of your... Yes? Right. Is there a willingness on the part of German uh, government officials to criticize uh, the PA and, and Hamas, and uh, how do they balance that with their concern for the large uh, minority? Right. Um, I haven't been back in Germany for a few, a little bit of time, and I'm going in a, in a few weeks, um, so I'm not as up on that point. But I would say this: that um, organizations like the American Jewish Committee and others have said that Germans, like the rest of the Europeans, are too sympathetic to the Palestinians, that the general European position is overly critical of Israel and too sympathetic to the Palestinians. Yet on the other hand, as we know, and I only can kind of suspect this from the Germans as well, that the Europeans um, are very critical of the new Hamas regime. They're not giving funds except for uh, humanitarian reasons. And um, I haven't followed it as closely, but I suspect that the Germans are trying to be, walk a careful line um, but are, as I say, because they support Israel and the right of Israel to exist, and based on what Hamas states, I can't imagine that they would be very sympathetic to the Hamas regime. Yeah. Good question. Um, Aside from Ignaz Bubis, who was the previous director, the president of the Central Council of Jews in Germany, most the, there are very few Jews in Germany who are politically prominent. Uh, Bubis was very prominent. He spoke out on issues beyond the Jewish issues. He talked about racism, xenophobia. He traveled widely in America. And um, his, his, his 
a successor has not has not been as 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 uh, forceful. Um, but aside from Bubis, who was suggested at one point to be the federal president of Germany, uh, who's in the FDP party, the Free Democratic Party, um, there are not really many prominent Jews who are in the political scene. What you get more of are these journalists that I spoke of, like Henrik Broder, for example, who's actually a Polish Jew, but uh, now considers himself a German Jew, um, who speaks out very forcefully, or others. There are prominent people on television, literary critics, talk show hosts, who people know that are Jewish and who speak out. But we don't have you know, a Joe Lieberman in Germany. Um, and you don't have prominent <coughs> Jewish people who are uh, prominent, uh, or Jews who are prominent politicians. Keep in mind that even when, with these big figures of 100,000, that's still less than 1% of, of the German population. It's still not a very large uh, percentage. What will be interesting, what is interesting politically, which is only in the in domestic scene, is that the political direction of all the Jewish communities are going increasingly Russian. There are communities in Germany that are 100% Russian now, and the, just in the Berlin community, after a number of very difficult and controversial elections, um, the, the head of the Berlin Jewish community, the last one who was a German Jew, left under duress, and now there's a Russian Jew. So as some people say now, even the Berlin Jewish community is completely Russified. And um, what will be, I suspect that it'll even be less easy for Russian Jews to become prominent in German politics. So um, I don't see much future in that regard. I think what ha needs to happen is that the German Jewish community itself has to become, through its, its institutions, more prominent in speaking for the interests of the, of the indigenous Jewish community. And as I said, one of the problems has been is that the German political elites tend to go to the American Jewish committee. Those are the Americans. And so some of the German Jews say, why are you going to the Americans? We're the Jew we live here. This is our country. So I say there's a number of different tensions. Yes? I was wondering about the Russian Yes. Well, this, this remains in part, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, John's the person I did my other book with, right, okay. <laughs> Right, that's part of the book Sojourners we did, yeah. Right. It's communist, right. And so they had sort of no identity. And I wondered if you could speak Sure. Sure. Yes. Um, let me answer the second part first. Um, it's interesting, <clears throat> when John and I finished the, the Sojourners, it had just been the, the reunification. And what we found were that some of these um, older communist Jews who had lived in the GDR, um, there was a variety of responses, but one in particular, um, whose husband had been in a, in, a, in a gulag and so on, had suffered a great deal, but remained a communist, said, now that the Germany is unified, I think I need, what did she say, one needs to know where one belongs. And then she decided to join the Jewish community at a, in, her, in her 80s. You find, though, interestingly, that even though um, Germany is unified, and then the Jewish communities became unified, that there's not a lot of interaction between the Jews from the East and the Jews from the West. The cultural group that I mentioned that's so important um, was started by a GDR Jew who had been born in the United States. And um, most of the people who go there are either East German Jews or Russian Jews. Um, so you have some of the same divisions that exist between East and West played out among the Jews of East and West as well. Regarding the cultural identity, um, again, because I 
I look at identity as something that is multiple and hybrid, <clears throat> you have a variety of situations. M many uh, of the Russian Jews identify as Russians as well. They speak Russian. There's a lot of Russians who are non-Jews who have also come to Germany. You hear Russian in Berlin on the street like you did in the early 20th century. Um, there are Russian magazines and so on. So s some of the, those Russian Jews identify with Russian non-Jews. As the generations are born and are learning German and are being educated in the German system, you're finding that they're staying and setting up homes, sending their kids to Jewish schools and so on. Of course, the issue of intermarriage always comes up. And I don't have statistics on that, but it'll be interesting to follow what kind of um, patterns there are in intermarriage between Russian Jews and non-Jews, be they Russian or German. Um, so uh, it's hard to say. There was a tradition up until the, and there is still some of this, the, until reunification, that Jewish children always went abroad. Their parents sent them to England, the United States, Canada, and so on. Sometimes they came back, sometimes they didn't. The question will be is how many of these new younger generations will stay in Germany? There are some signs, um, for example, that there is a, um, at least religiously, there is a reformed, in Potsdam outside of Berlin, there's now a rabbinical seminary for reformed Judaism. The, the young men I interviewed there said, we want to stay in Germany. We want to have our uh, congregations here. Other younger Jews that I met said, no, we want to still go away. Others went away, came back. There are even some Russian Jews, I understand, who are going back to the former Soviet Union because they feel the situation. So it remains to be seen. Um, but the hope is that there'll some, be enough to stay to keep a community going because it's clear by 2010 there are not going to be many more Jews coming from the former Soviet Union. So it's going to have to be grown from inside. That's just I guess, that's some demography figures that I know that were established that in terms of who's there, how many people are left to come. Yes. It's an important question, and we could have an interesting discussion uh, with Rabbi <laughs> about this. <laughs> um, let me tell you what my position has been, and, and this is again why I emphasize the fact that I come to this as an American Jew who's a Reformed Jew. Um, I see the benefit in America of having a variety of opportunities of being identified as Jewish. I see the benefits of people who are, have Jewish fathers and non-Jewish mothers and so on. I see in Germany the disadvantage of people who feel excluded from the community because of that, or there are other reasons as well. I mean, there are, there are cultural reasons in Germany where one woman I interviewed said, I just don't like them. They're, they think they're better than we are. So there is still the old tensions between the Yekas, the German Jews, and the Eastern European Jews. But in, I guess I would say that, <clears throat> because I tend to be more of a cultural identified Jew, and I see people there who are like that, is that it would, I think it would be beneficial to be able to have a space, a place, whether institutionally or not, to be Jewish in, in another way aside from being religious. It's clear why that's the case in Germany. And there are many people um, who say, here in America as well, that we need to identif identify our Jewishness through religion, not just through culture. But um, I think that as we see this diversity uh, expanding, and if people do not want to become a part of the official community, where will they go? And of course, this is where Chabad Lubavitch also comes in and has been very attractive. They provide Shabbos packages, they'll give you, you know, all the things you need, they'll pick you up, they'll do all kinds of things to bring you to uh, services. So I think the question will be is, how porous, how open can an identity be in Germany? Uh, and I don't want to, you know, say it has to be the way it is here, but can there be a more heterogeneous, porous identity that can develop in Germany for the Jewish community? I'm afraid that if it doesn't, we might see the breakdown of the institution, which has happened in some places already, that the Central Council can no longer maintain its hold on Jewish life in Germany because there are too many other people wanting to speak. I mean, it goes back to the question of who speaks for the Jews. Yeah. Would it be a bad thing if that central 
Council? I hesitate to say that publicly. I mean, personally, <laughs> personally, I don't think it would be a bad thing, but I don't say that in Germany. Um, it's, in a way, it's, it's arrogant of me to, to, to suggest that. But I guess I'd rather say I think it would be good if there were more, more opportunities. Robert? Along those lines, yeah. I think the American Federation model offers a kind of umbrella yeah. for a broad, diverse, cultural, religious, exactly. multi-entry point community that, that you see as, as right. diverse. Right, right. That's why I'm helpful. I'm hopeful when American when, when American Jews uh, of all sorts, as well as rabbis, are brought over to Germany to meet the community and so on, so that the Jewish community there can see what oppor what options there are. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because the, the Jewish model is the model, <laughs> in a sense, because Germany does not have a tradition of minorities, right? Um, officially, up until recently, the only minorities that were considered official minorities in Germany were the Danes in Schleswig-Holstein and the Sorbs in Eastern Germany. And these are not really minorities, right? So in a German political discourse, they didn't talk about Jews as a minority. Um, they didn't talk, use the term minority in the way that we do here. What's interesting, though, is the reverse, is that the Turks, the secular Turkish Jewish organizations today, are starting to talk about using the Jews as their model and saying, let's be more, let's operate politically more the way the Jews have. And it's gone interestingly far so far that some of the secular Jews, and I emphasize secular, not fundamentalist, the secular Turkish Muslim organizations, for example, in Berlin, are saying that when Jew Turks become German citizens, they also must take on the legacy of the Holocaust if they're going to be Germans. This dialogue between Turks and Jews is something that has not been developed as much as we would imagine, but the American Jewish community, for example, has been bringing Turkish and Turks and Jews together to talk about these things. Um, but it remains to be seen where that's going to go. And let me just say finally to this, which you might find interesting, at this meeting that I went to with Jewish study scholars from Germany and the United States, we all were talking about what's going to happen in the future for the Jewish studies at the university in Germany, because there are a lot of Jewish studies programs that are populated primarily by non-Jews. And the government, uh, the support has come, they felt, partly because of the legacy of the Holocaust. But as the legacy of the Holocaust weakens, What's going to make the German government and others want to support Jewish studies? And what they, everyone suggested was is that the Jewish studies need to be tied to Muslim studies. The Jews and the Muslims have to work more together to create examples of how these patterns can be used by each other and how these different kinds of minorities can work together. So in that way, Germany is far behind our tradition in the United States of minorities working together. Sure, thank you.